Okay, again, thank you on behalf of uh, the Friends of HPL. Um, I am the Friends Administrator here at uh, Edward Public Library, and it's our membership kickoff. We usually put a program on every year to kind of kick off the membership drive for the following year, and all the memberships, of course, that are, are used, are, that are purchased tonight are good for all of next year. Um, we've had a lot of exciting things we've been doing. We've got a great board, and all the board members, if they just want to raise their hand, of all the ones that are here. Okay, and uh, just um, let you know that they've been working real hard to, um, to get a lot of projects done for this coming year. Um, but we do want to introduce Mark. I know he's kind of introduced himself, and that's yes. fine. Uh, Mark Moran, uh, um, antique appraiser, and and again, thank all of you for uh, bringing your items in tonight. Uh, um, hopefully, it'll be an interesting and uh, a good show for you all. Okay. Thank you. You bet, Mark. And again, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, you know, uh, the first time that I was in this area, it was over at the library in Milton. And you may remember that front page uh, from my visit where I beat out actually Mitt and Newt for the main art on the front page of the, of the newspaper. Yeah, you know, I was, I was pretty happy about that. And uh, so honestly, I, I, I have to thank the Gazette for um, all their great coverage of the program. Um, I always like to begin uh, by saying that your access to me and the information that I can share doesn't end when the program ends. Feel free to take my cards. There's stacks of them on, on the front of the table here. Um, you can follow up, you know, give me a call. <clears throat> uh, send images as attachments to email. I'm always happy to, to follow up after the events. Uh, you can also visit my website where you will see my uh, endless schedule of travels. Uh, I, when I first launched this series of programs, 15 months ago. I hoped that in the first year that I could average two a week. I thought if I could get 100 events the first year that that would be a good target, a good goal. And I passed that in five months. And uh, just uh, yesterday, the, the library in um, Altoona, uh, just, which is up by Eau Claire, uh, booked a program for next year. And that, I think, I'm almost, I'm getting close to 200 events booked in the first 15 months, which is pretty amazing and, and very gratifying. Um, you know, people always ask, would I rather be doing this or would I rather be on Antiques Roadshow? I'd much rather be doing this any day. Um, you know, I love doing Antiques Roadshow. They invited me back uh, on the show this season, um, but they only do six stops a summer. And they, they wrapped up the, the, the series, of the, the tour, uh, in August in Seattle. <clears throat> and every one of their events this year, I was already booked doing this. So I wasn't able to, to get back. But I, I know they'll call next year. I just hope it's a little sooner uh, before I'm, I'm completely uh, booked all next summer. Um, you know, Antiques Roadshow is a brutal day. It's a fun day, and the camaraderie with all the appraisers is, is just great. But, you know, uh, most people don't realize that we don't get paid to be on Antiques Roadshow, and we have to pay all our own travel expenses. So it's a good deal for them, but it's a good deal for us, too. Uh, you know, we get the credibility of being associated with the, with the program. Uh, not a day goes by that I don't get a phone call or an email uh, as a result of being listed on their website. So we get credibility, we get visibility, and uh, we get to be on TV. <clears throat> so um, it's, a, it's a great experience to have. You know, if you uh, are lucky enough to get tickets for Roadshow, and again, you know, I get calls saying, this, this piece has got to be on Antiques Roadshow. And I always say, fantastic. Put your name in the lottery for tickets, because that's the only way to get tickets. Uh, is if their name is pulled out. Uh, now, some people um, get tickets and never go, and they put them on Craigslist or they put them on eBay and they sell them. Uh, a, a woman and her daughter that I know of paid $200 each to go to the Antiques Roadshow event in Minneapolis last summer. So, um, uh, in 2011, I should say. So, uh, it's 
it's a uh, it's just the luck of the draw if you can get your your items you know but if 10,000 people show up at Antiques Roadshow and that happens a lot uh, and, and ultimately 10 of them have their treasures featured on the program that's about the right odds the odds of someone having something you know valuable or important or extremely rare is about a thousand to one but it happens every day and some of them actually come into my programs uh, which is always fun um, but if you do get on Roadshow you might get you know 30 seconds with an appraiser uh, they have to keep them moving I mean there's 50 of us but but they they have to keep them moving through there and if your item is deemed worthy of going on camera at that moment the appraiser that you are facing if it was me you know I would have to stop talking to you instantly and ask you to go and sit behind a curtain and then while you're sitting there I have to alert the producers and the producer comes and I tell them the tale I say here's what this is here's a you know wonderful old apple jug we'll be talking about this in a minute um, and here's why it's important and here's what the last one that I can find sold for and you know and so I give them the tale and then the, the producers uh, interview you and it's it's a grilling uh, in, 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 the, in the American Antiques Roadshow you have to own the item that you bring in uh, in the Antiques Roadshow UK you can bring it in for you know Aunt Martha or Grandpa Frank or the, the guy next door doesn't matter uh, but in, in, the, uh, in the American version, you, you should own the item. And you know, the, the producers want people who are a little clueless. They don't want people who know more about the item than the appraisers do. And that happens. You know, people, people come in and, and they just kind of pour out the whole history of, of the item and all the minutia. And um, the producers would rather have someone who doesn't know that so that they have that that wow moment at the end and they all the producers always say when you tell the guest the value of the item just let it happen you know don't talk over them don't you know just let it kind of sink in and, and let them appreciate that moment so and I've always liked that uh, but from the moment that you know you are chosen then you have some paperwork to sign you have to go to the green room to be made up and then you have to uh, sit and wait until your turn comes, our turn comes. From, but, but when the, the time between the moment you come to my table and the time that we sit down in front of the cameras, that could be two or three hours. So, you know, um, if, you, if you really, really want to get on camera with your treasure, um, don't know too much about it and be very, very patient. So, uh, but again, if you go to my website, you can also click on the links to my videos uh, on, on the on Antiques Roadshow website. And, um, you know, uh, no matter how many of these programs I do, I never know how much I know until I'm presented with a question or a puzzle or a challenge. So, let's see how much I know. You know what, the gentleman, if you don't mind, the gentleman brought up this wonderful uh, apple jug, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that there was hard cider in here, because it's, it's so empty. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you get this wonderful apple jug? Uh, I bought a house 44 years ago in Lake Geneva, and there was a little shed out there in the back, and it was uh -huh. buried in the corner. It was buried in the corner? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, you know, I've seen this apple jug before. Have you ever seen another one like it? No. It's a beauty. I mean, you've got the it's, you've got the wonderful form. You've got the big leaves. You know, on the back here, you've got the handles in the form of branches, and this big empty panel here. That's where the label went for the. I think it was white, uh, white apple cider. The the the. the the uh, grower's name or the bottler's name was white uh, and I, I had one just like it's in wonderful condition still it had the cork in it uh, yeah or, that's not the original that's not the original cork well they're rare but there it is right there 
the exact same one, same dimensions, same condition. 1920s is what it dates from. Um, and it's, you know, they, there are a few of them out there, but I could only find auction results for one. 20 bucks <laughs> is what it's worth. Thanks for bringing it in. All right. So we're moving now. Okay. Who, who belongs to this? And, and he, there's a little note here that, that must make you Mitzi. Uh, well, hello, Mitzi. Thank you for coming. Um, this is lovely. How did you get this? Uh, I got it in Hong Kong in about 1981. Uh -huh. I uh, had a very good friend there through a business connection, and uh, we decided that um, my husband had traveled there before I did, and mm -hmm. he had one or two at home, and everybody commented on it. And he said, why don't you start a business with Pat Pie, and she can start looking for this stuff, and then you can buy it, and you can import it and sell it. And so I did. Okay. And I was quite successful. I got to travel and write my trips off. And, uh, no, that's, <laughs> that's the, I, yeah, the I advantage had, of working for yourself. I had, <laughs> yeah, I sold two or three of them to a gentleman in Milwaukee, and he donated them to the Milwaukee Public Museum. Very nice. were hanging there for a while. Uh huh. Well, it, again, it's a it's an architectural panel, like a lintel or a valance, uh, from a Buddhist temple. Right. Uh, did you have when when you were importing these? Did you have any sense of their age? Yes. Okay. Yes, I had certificates for all of them. <laughs> okay. Um, so what's the so what, over, if, all I would say is that they were over a hundred years old. Yes. And if they came in duty-free, mm -hmm. um, I had to, if I had any questions, I took the certificates and... Sure. Well, it may be difficult to see, but, you know, of course it's one piece of wood that has been elaborately carved this way. You have, you've got, you know, it's first there's this, this outdoor scene with riders on horseback, warriors and guards. <laughs> And, and you know temple figures and you know it's just incredibly elaborate most of the ones that I've seen are not quite this elaborate they are usually just uh, carved floral designs they're leaves and you've probably seen some of those too I've seen some of those. yeah and some of those are pretty as well. yeah though they are and but but some of them are huge the last one I saw was 12 feet long oh, wow. and it had huge arches and it was all carved leaves Again, each panel was one piece of wood. It was actually in three pieces. Well, there's a hotel in Hong Kong that has one whole wall that is solid. Yeah. Like yeah. this, and they put it together, you know, very, yeah. it's absolutely beautiful. So, so when, can I ask when it was that you were importing and selling these? I started in 1980. Okay, that was a good time to start. Yeah. Yeah. Was, I got. I, I quit when it got. To, yeah. Well, got too tough when it well, started yeah. opening up more. But you had. But you had about 15 years there, mm -hmm. where where it was business was pretty good. Yeah, it was very good. Late 90s. That was the time when things started to change. Um, so, can I ask retail what you would have been asking for these? Retail? Yes. I would have asked about three thousand, thirty-five hundred. Yeah, yeah, and I think that in the in the eighties and nineties that would have been about right. Um, the problem is that so many of these have been reproduced, and the reproductions, as I'm sure you know, have hurt the business for everyone. There's nothing that has not been reproduced. Uh, you know, people always ask me why have so many categories of antiques and collectibles declined in value and, and honestly it's because the quality of the reproductions are so good yeah. you know in, in in the past they would have been crude and chunky and not nearly this lovely um, you know and, and and but now they are the, the craftsmen are using you know much better tools they're being paid more um, and, and as a result it's driven down the prices for everything else now this is not can I turn this around just so people sure. can see the back? Because you can see it's just it's like like cells 
in a in a beehive. It's all it's all and it's one piece of wood. And nothing was glued on. No, no, no. It's all it's all in relief. At least a good four inches of relief all the way to the back. So it is incredible. Um, uh, the the twelve foot section that I mentioned the, that has all that held all, all the floor. Now that's big. Okay, which, which makes it harder to be accommodated in a contemporary home. That sold for five hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, yeah, just this year at auction. And you know, I don't think it was nearly as nice as this. I think the size in this case doesn't hurt it. I don't think bigger is better in that case. Smaller is better here. Uh, but honestly, I think today it, it's about a fifteen hundred dollar piece. So that's just the way the market the market has gone. Now, it, that's not true of of all really good Asian art and artifacts. In fact, Chinese uh, art and artifacts of really, really high quality uh, could not be hotter. It's the single hottest collecting category. You may have seen the, uh, the episode on Antiques Roadshow, the gentleman who brought in the rhino horn cups. Uh, he, he, it, this, oh, yeah. this happened last season. Yeah, I did. He had five rhino horn cups, and they're called libation cups. They're just tiny little things. They're light as a feather. And they just flare out, and they are, they're carved around the perimeter with you know, branches and flowers and sometimes figures. And, and um, they are, you know, some of them are 18th century, some of them are 19th century. Uh, but um, he brought them to the Oriental table, and my buddy Lark Mason was there. And Lark, uh, you know, I would trust, he's, he's as honest as the day is long. And a, and a gentleman, uh, and he knew that while the while the owner, the collector, uh, was aware that they were valuable, that he wasn't really up on where the market was for for these items. the The owner of these five rhino horn cups thought that they were worth two hundred thousand dollars, and it, as it turns out, they were worth three hundred thousand dollars each. <laughs> 1.5 million. So that's that's the highest uh, single appraisal uh, valuation of any item that's come into uh, the American Antiques Roadshow. And then, then the, the, the second place one is also Chinese. It was a J collection that I think was about 1.1 million. So um, if you have a good eye, and clearly you do, uh, you know, it's you can you can still find some treasures out there. So. I bought it to sell, but when I got it, I won't put it to sell. I don't I don't blame you. I don't blame. When I was a dealer, you know, that years ago, dealers only take home two things: they take home the treasures and they take home their mistakes. <laughs> so that was fun. Let's go down here. Um, now we were talking. I was talking to the owner of the chair. Who was, yes, hi. hi. So tell me how this came into your life. Um, my uncle in Watertown remarried. His first wife had died. Uh -huh. And in 1963, he remarried. And a lovely second wife found this up in the attic of their home. And nobody knew where it was from, so we think it was from the first wife's family. Okay. This was around the time we were starting our family, and uh -huh. she wondered if we would like this high chair and we've loved it ever since well you know we were I was I was talking we were talking earlier that that this belonged to a very lucky little boy or girl but who, who was it or both uh, we had both okay we called it the Queen's chair. that's <laughs> that's a good name that that's a good name it's a it's a lovely little chair and and, it, and it's been refinished and that doesn't hurt the value one single bit you know the one of the one of the great uh, misconceptions that has been uh, spread by Antiques Roadshow is that you should never refinish anything, which is really nonsense. Um, you know, if you have a, a piece of furniture that's nicked up and dinged up and worn and the varnish is turned and it's all crackled and flaking and chipping, um, you don't want to display it, you don't want to live with it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, with refinishing a piece of furniture unless unless it's the work of a great 
uh, New York or Philadelphia or, or Rhode Island a cabinet maker or craftsman or a category of furniture where original finish has so many different descriptions and, and levels of value like arts and crafts furniture, uh, Roycroft and Limbert and Stickley. And, and if you're not familiar with those names, you can find out about them in very short order by Googling them and seeing the difference in prices for uh, original untouched finish. And they have a dozen other descriptions for you know, different conditions of, of, of finish. So it's, it's a lovely little chair. Um, you know, it looks like the seat is oak or ash. Uh, the back is uh, kind of a, I think it's kind of a maple, but it has a, a figured, you know, that it looks like mahogany. It was dark brown. It was a little reddish brown. Reddish brown. Yeah, it had a, it had a mahogany stain. Um, it's, it's very much in the late Art Nouveau style. And Art Nouveau was basically from 1890 to 1910. And so this one, I think, was probably from about 1910, 1915. Does that make sense in terms of when it might have come into the family? It's such a mystery. OK, OK. Um, you know, I, I, I love it as a, as a height. It's, it's the prettiest height chair um, th that I've ever seen. It would have never had a, a, a tray on the front. There's no sign of that. Wonderful little scrolls on the arms. This really delicate pierced splat here. Uh, this carving that's that's applied. And I think the queen's chair is a is a pretty good um, description. Uh, the stretcher, the pierced stretcher in the front, and the and the little turned spindles on the side. Very nice. Very nice. Um, there's no category of furniture or no category of antiques. Uh, that's declined as much as furniture. And, you know, that again goes to what we were talking about, about the, the reproductions uh, of being so good that it, it, it's driven down the market. However, it is such a, a pretty delicate, you know, little uh, tall chair for a child and in just wonderful condition. Um, I think that's a $150 chair. So I hope that's helpful. I think it's a, a keepsake and not a, a selling chair. Okay, good. That's 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 good. That's good. Okay, um, where should we go next? How about how about the 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 lithograph back here? Brian was showing this to me, and I want to very carefully move this forward. I hope everyone can see that. Okay. I want to make sure that it stays in as good a condition as it's in. Now, the the owner of this is, is not here, right? I am. Oh, oh, you, you're here. Oh, hi. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank she was sitting there watching me move this thing. <laughs> no. um, and I can take it out. If it no, no, because, because I was looking at it, and it is delicate. And it's condition, it, it needs to be... It needs to be, you know, well taken care of. Yes. So we're going to do that. <laughs> Tell me how this came into your life. I bought it at auction. I, my husband uh, buys at auction for a store that we have. He buys to make money, and when I go, I just buy stuff for myself. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I don't spend very much. Always under ten dollars. So I bought it for seven dollars, and oh. I just really was attracted to the color at first, and then when I got up close and uh, saw what it was, it was very interesting to me, but at the same time, um, it wasn't something I would hang on the wall because of right. uh, the subject matter. Right. But, um, what, what we can't see <coughs> is, the, is the text down at the bottom, and this is uh, the burning of San Francisco after the earthquake in 1906. Um, and it, it is a, a chromolithograph, uh, and it was printed by a company called Schmidt, which I believe was also based in uh, San Francisco. And, you know, so it's 106 years old. Um, it, it has some condition issues. Now, is it mounted on this board in the back, or oh, is I, it loose? Oh, yes, it is mounted on the, the board. This, yeah. this board, right. The yes, board. right. Yep, yep. And, you know, there are some little condition issues. There's a tear here. Um, there's, a, there's another, you know, you know, split right there, 
and again, it's it's very very fragile. Um, you know, when they when they made these, uh, they were again producing them very very quickly, so that it was a souvenir of that of that you know uh, catastrophe. And and really, for a long time, um, the the uh, San Francisco earthquake uh, was considered to be one of the most documented you know disasters that has that has ever uh, occurred. Uh, you know, I, I, I get so many people bringing in items about the, associated with the sinking of the Titanic. And again, a great, you know, human disaster. But whereas the, the San Francisco earthquake is so well documented, the, the sinking of the Titanic, just to compare, uh, was the last great human disaster that wasn't photographed. You know, when, when the Titanic hit that iceberg, it was 20 minutes to 12. Uh, and it sank 20 minutes after 12, 40 minutes later after first striking it. There was no way it could be photographed. Uh, so this is based on actual, you know, uh, eyewitness accounts. I found many, many uh, striking photographs of the aftermath of the San Francisco earthquake, including long panorama shots, yard longs. You may have seen those as well. Uh, but not too many lithographs and not this lithograph. I've seen, I've, I've seen this, one that was in black and white, very detailed, uh, but not one with this wonderful color. And honestly, the color of it is still, is still great, in, despite its condition issues. So you wouldn't have paid more than 10 bucks for it? Or, okay. <laughs> um, even in this condition, and, and it is rough, but it is a rare image. Uh, because the other lithograph that I found that wasn't nearly as nice as this, but was in better condition, although just black and white, yeah. sold for $600. So in this condition, I'm going to say about half that, about $300. So maybe you should let her be buying a little more. <laughs> and the next time you're, you're going uh, to an auction, call me. <laughs> and I'll come along, and then we'll see what we can find. She has so. a whole treasure full of stuff. In the she's, attic that she she's, she's got a good eye. She's got a good eye. Well, I'm glad you were here. I'm glad you were here. We're going we're gonna to move this back and make sure it stays in good condition. All right. All right. You know, this is, this is interesting. Hannah. Hello, Hannah. Hannah, tell me about this uh, this cool desk. I actually don't know that much about it. Um, okay. It was my uh, my mother-in-law's, and she passed away last year, so mm -hmm. it came to my husband and I. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably should have talked to him more before I came here. Oh, no, that's okay. But um, I know that it's at least they've had it at least for twenty years. Uh huh. I remember it when he was younger. Um. Okay. Well, it's. It, it's it's a it's a wonderful uh, little desk. Do you use it, or is it just really a display piece? Um, at this point, we're using it. Okay, because I'm going to open the front so that people can see the loafers, and and you'll see what I mean by the loafers. Because when you pull this out, there they come to support the desk. Does everyone see that? And then they're going back in. See? Okay. Okay. Yeah, you gotta you gotta ease them back in. There they go. There they go. They're disappearing. Um, so black lacquer, um, early 20th century, rather than so just after 1900, rather than before 1900. Uh, hard stone. All these figures you see on here are are made out of what's called hard stone, one word. And these type of this sort of uh, furniture decorated with these wonderful figures. There's dancing women. Um, you know, there are acrobats. There are, you know, playing instruments. Um, you know, very, very nice. Very nice. Um, I've never seen a desk like this. Uh, mostly I see tables or table screens decorated with these same hard stone figures. Do you look like you didn't disagree, you didn't agree with that it was after 1900? Do you think it's before 1900? No, I was oh. just surprised. I oh. Maybe she got it at Pier 1, you know, I don't know. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. 
But, but you know, you could probably find something similar to this at Pier 1 today. Um, no, no, I think it's right around 1900, but, but after rather than before. Uh, these black uh, lacquer pieces uh, were very, very popular. They were imported in, in huge numbers. Oftentimes in the later 20th century, you could find coffee tables in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, you know, this is definitely uh, early 20th century. And typical of these is the, is the chipping in the, in the lacquer. That's very, very common. Um, but, you know, it's, it's overall it's in wonderful shape. You, can't, you may not be able to see the sides. It's decorated with roses, red and pink and white roses. And there's, there's a bird in a, in a tree in a, in a wonderful kind of a cinnabar colored blooms. So very nice, in pretty good condition. Um, you know, I, you could certainly, if you wanted to invest in having the lacquer touched up, I think a good restorer could take care of that without too much trouble. Um, that's a $500 desk. So thanks for bringing it. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Cool. You're welcome. Um, let's see. Maybe we'll do we'll do one more, and then we'll take a little break, and then we'll 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 wrap up. Um, okay. What about this lady? Hi. Hello. How did you how did you get this the, the little flower vendor? <laughs> it was my mother's cousin's. Okay. And Okay, well, there is um, there is a mark on the bottom that is the kind of mark that you you hope to see. It's uh, two crossed swords, which normally would be the mark of Meissen, uh, which is a German porcelain manufacturer. They were German. They were German. Okay, so you know, very very nice nice condition. Again, twentieth century, not not nineteenth century. Um, she's in she's in beautiful beautiful condition. With think about so many high points. I mean, she's sitting there knitting, so she's got little knitting needles in her hands. The flowers here are are completely you know three dimensional, standing out from the shelf. Here's the branch wrapping up around, and the mark on the bottom. It has a style number two four three one. And then another gilt mark, which looks like a, a pound sign under a crown. Now, the, the, in this case, it's a crossed sword and an arrow. So it's not actually mice. Um, I have a feeling that it's uh, probably uh, it could, continental, probably not, rather than, than German, which could, have, could mean Eastern Europe. Uh, not English. Um, you know, there's a way that age sits on a piece, and and it has to do with with dust and heat and cold and moisture and and the softening of the colors. And as a piece of bisque, it 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 looks pretty fresh. I mean, it's in wonderful condition. It's in wonderful condition, but it just doesn't have the kind of age that I would expect to see if it had been an earlier piece of Meissen, a 19th century piece of Meissen. Definitely 20th century, definitely, um, you know, porcelain bisque. There's one, there might be one little chip on this flower down here. It's a tiny thing, but I don't think it affects the value uh, that much. Sometimes a little, a little damage uh, can have a big effect. Um, a woman called me up once and she had a cookie jar that she wanted me to help her. <coughs> figure out the value of it. She was describing it to me over the phone. And I said, is it in perfect condition? And she said, it's 95% perfect. <laughs> and I had never heard anybody describe something as 95%, you know? It's either perfect or it's not. So, uh, but I, I really loved that answer. And you know, that, 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 woman's, uh, that woman's glass is always half full, never half empty. 
Um, so there might be a tiny little bit of damage down there, but I don't think it, it affects the value yeah, that I much. I have one question. Sure. Doesn't that one rose look extraordinarily large? In proportion to the other flowers. Yeah, it, it, it does. It almost it almost looks like a cabbage <laughs> right down here. Yeah, and I and I have a feeling that again that was that was hand applied and so it probably would have varied in size based you know you know depending on the modeler who made this. Um, uh, 20th century, it's it's a good piece, it's not a great piece. Um, you know, I think today, if you saw this in an antique shop, um, I don't think you would have to get, I don't think you'd get much change back from $80, maybe 100 on a good day. I'm just so curious as to what the watermark meant. Yeah, and yeah. Beach, and, and, you know, I'm pretty sure it's German, maybe Austrian. Okay. So, very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, they've got some treats back there. So we'll just take a short break and then we will we'll reconvene and we'll finish off the treasures. I, I just wanted to say, you know, the, 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 just a couple of folks had asked me about, you know, some of my upcoming events and um, you know, I wanted just wanted to let you know that I do make house calls uh, if I am in town for a program and I don't have to charge for mileage. Uh, it's just seventy-five dollars an hour. We can do an unlimited amount of uh, items in that time. You know, so for people who have big things or fragile things or a lot of things, uh, that has proved to be a very popular option. So again, uh, go to my website and you'll see when I'll be coming to a library near you. <laughs> again, and I'll be in um, Milton again in January, I believe. I'll be in Monroe again next summer, uh, Cambridge, uh, Fort Atkinson, and a, a lot of the programs I do are for historical societies, and they're, they are fundraisers. Uh, I don't know of any historical society that is uh, flush with cash. So, uh, <laughs> You know, I'm always happy to do fundraisers, and they have proved to be very, very popular. I did a program for the Florence County Historical Society, which is, you know, up near Iron Mountain. Florence still holds the record. Uh, it was on a Sunday at the end of April this year. 125 people showed up, and I had 10 house calls. I couldn't get, up, I couldn't get to all the house calls uh, that weekend. I had to do them all. A month later, I had to finish them up when I was at the Dickinson County Library in Iron Mountain. So, uh, just wanted to a, an unabashed commercial plug for for house calls. I, I, I want to talk about the bear. Tell me about your bear. Well, I had it when I was a little girl. It was my aunt for oh. uh -huh. and I think she got it like. Twelve or two or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a snake, although it could be. Yeah, you know, I was looking at it earlier, and there are. It's it's a wonderful jointed mohair bear. It is not Stife. I wish it was. Uh, Stife has some very uh, specific, very telltale characteristics. First off, is the button in the ear. Oh, it doesn't have one? It does not have a button in the ear. Nope, nope, no button. Um, but the ears have come off and got sewed back on. So you think maybe they sewed another bear's ears on it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's there the same ears. I don't know. Okay. I, I don't, I don't Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's there. It's like a You know, he does look, he does look like a stife. He looks like what they call the, the stife champagne mohair bear. Um, it's, it, it, it's interesting, you know, not a lot of people really know the history of Marguerite Stife. She was um, an amazing woman. And I just wanted to share that with you if I could. She was born in 1847 and she died in 1909 when the bears were just really starting to take off. Um, she was confined to a wheelchair. She had had polio when she was a little girl. And she started making stuffed animals as a hobby for her you know, nieces and nephews. 
uh, elephants. Uh, they were based on a, on a design. Uh, the elephants were the first ones. She had seen a picture of an elephant in the magazine. And so she started creating uh, elephants based on that design. And they were originally sold as pin cushions. They weren't, they weren't nearly this big. Um, but when children started playing with them, and the parents noticed that the children were playing with them, uh, she went on to design you know, many other animals, dogs, cats, pigs, and of course, uh, the wonderful uh, bears. She designed and made most of the prototypes herself. Uh, by 1903, the firm that she had built up with her brother, Fritz, uh, was producing a jointed mohair teddy bear. And the production increased dramatically so that by 1907, they were making almost a million units a year, a million bears a year. Um, the button in the ear, which is the most famous Stife characteristic, was uh, the idea of one of her nephews, uh, Franz, because even back then, there were knockoffs of Stife bears. And so they put the button in the ear so that you knew that you were getting a real Stife bear. So we have a wonderful early 20th century uh, mohair teddy bear, all jointed, well so well loved, that, thank you. That is the, exactly the way to describe it. You know, the head, some of them have had growlers, but I don't think this one did. And, and some of them have a more pronounced hump on the back, so they call those humpback bears. And also some of them, the construction, especially with Stife, they, there's a rod going down the body to give it more strength, and they call those rod bears. Um, Stife bears have big feet. I mean, these, these are, are, are you know, really small little, little paws, but if it was a Stife, the, the actual paw would come up about a good two or three inches. Uh, they have sewn noses so that the stitching goes back and forth across the nose. This has a solid uh, cloth nose. No, wonderful little shoe button eyes. Uh, the, the pads on the, on the uh, front legs have been replaced, and I have a feeling that those have been replaced too. It, it has been well loved. It's been told many, many secrets. <laughs> and, and because of that, it's had most of the value loved right out of it. Yes. <laughs> but you know what? That's not, that's not important. He's a wonderful, does he have a name? Well, you know, Daniel was asking me, I, I think I must have called him. Or Probably. Chair. Probably. <laughs> nice chair. Nice, 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 or poo, or something like that. You never called him poo, poo bear. No. Oh, no. No. Okay. My daughter has an original. No, she has a stud bear, uh -huh. which she never toys with. Uh huh. Which I think they mom didn't let her play with. <laughs> because someday. You know, so often I see. The wonderful, wonderful toys coming into the program, and they have the original boxes, and they're just in mint condition. But I'd much rather see a toy like this that has been played with and loved, because when I see the, the toys in mint condition, it means that they, you know, a child got it on Christmas Day, and they were all excited, and they played with it for a day or two, and they put away and forgot. And today, of course, they're worth a lot more money, but this one, you know, has there's so many more wonderful memories. In this condition, 80 to $100, perhaps. It's, it's not a stife bear, but it's still a wonderful bear. It's going to stay in the family. OK. OK. Thank you. Thank you. The chair's not bad either. It's got a wonderful little needlepoint needle point seat. Um, so who belongs to the quilt? Me. There's the quilt lady. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Well, then, then you can help me to hold it up. It so that. Oh no, my pleasure. Here, let's let's take a corner. We'll take this back. Very nice. Well, uh, tell me how you got this wonderful crazy quilt. This is my great 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 grandmother's work. Okay. So I inherited it. Okay. Um, and the back, of course, is very, very plain. It's just a kind of a, it's almost like a flannel, which is what it should be. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, the story that I was told about okay. the quilt is that it's made from men's suits. Uh huh. Um, whatever would have been in good shape when the suit was worn and ready to be disposed of. Sure. And that a group of women traded pieces. Uh huh. And then made these larger squares for right. each other and then swapped them around. Right, exactly. And then joined them and did. I'm not sure whether she did the fine work mm -hmm. or whether the various women did the fine work on their, it, their it, own squares. It, it makes a lot of sense that it's men's clothing because so often I see these wonderful crazy quilts that have significant patches of silk and silk just deteriorates and, and it's just like, like you know, torn butterfly wings flapping uh, in, in the breeze. Um, now, these were some pretty uh, gaudy suits. I mean, look at this one right here. <laughs> if, if, if you watch Antiques Roadshow, that's the that's kind that right. Nick Lowry would be. If you know who Nick is, who does the posters, he wears those horse blankets. He has those made, he has those custom made for him in England. <laughs> On purpose? On purpose. <laughs> On purpose. So here's another, here's another uh, Nico. We call him Nico. He's just, he's just a, real, a lovable knucklehead. Uh, but he's a, he's a good guy. So it's one of the better crazy quilts um, that I've seen, and in, and in wonderful condition. Um, here, let's fold it back up here. Um, no, it, it really is. And as I said, if, if, they are, if they're silk, you know, those panels just end up uh, deteriorating um, and, and really falling to pieces. You know. OK, go ahead. You can lay it down. Um, there's, there's, there's two ways. There's two ways to um, assess a quilt. One is uh, its graphic impact. And, and really, this has wonderful graphic impact. Uh, it really should be hanging on a wall. How, is that how you display it? Yes. Good. Uh, because on a bed, you just can't appreciate it. And there's always a chance that the cat's going to come up with it. No, OK. The other, which is really not as applicable in this instance, is stitches per inch. Because in a, in a traditional quilt, you can see the stitches. You can see the stitching on, on the top. And if you can get five or six or seven stitches per inch, that's a good average. But if you see a really wonderful, I mean, even the new ones being made today, a wonderful Amish quilt, you, you can get 10, 11, 12 stitches per inch, which is just mind boggling if you think how long uh, you know, it, it, it takes to create those. Um, we see lots and lots of crazy quilts on, on Antiques Roadshow. And, uh, you know, as nice as this and, and better, um, uh, it's, it's part of what we, we would call country antiques, which is not, you know, uh, a category that has really thrived in the last 15 or 20 years. You know, back in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, Country Living Magazine was coming out with these lush, you know, uh, photo spreads showing you how to decorate in your home with country antiques. And that explains why at, at one time everyone had a pair of crossed snowshoes over their fireplace. <laughs> you can't give those things away now, you know. Um, it's, I, it's, a, it's a wonderful quilt and a wonderful piece of folk art because that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a great... Uh, great American uh, folk art form. Uh, it doesn't seem like enough, but today, 200 to 250 would be, would be the value for it. Thanks for, for bringing it and for your timely arrival. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, chairs. Those are mine. These are, these are, these are your chairs. Did the, did, were, were, were these the deck chairs that they were arranging on the Titanic? No. <laughs> they're, uh, I don't, they're pretty old because I dug them out of a basement in a cottage. And uh, the cottage has been in my family for over 100 years. OK. So I don't know how old they are, but I imagine they're fairly old. Well, they are. I mean, they're, they're, pro they're right around the 1910. Uh, you know, maybe as late as the 20s, but I think more likely probably around 1910, 1915. It's interesting because the seat on this one, I think, has all of the, all of the little planks in there. And then in this one, you just got every other one. 
Um, uh, so, I mean, they, they're they still pretty sturdy. Do you use them? I mean, do you sit on them? No, I, I actually just dug them out of a basement in a cottage about a month ago. Uh -huh. My parents clean up their cottage every year. And, <sighs> well, I, if, you, if you look on the bottom of them all, or on each one, they have um, one that says Sheboygan, and then the other one, it just says Patton and that's what, that's what, yes, yeah, someone said earlier. And Sheboygan was a furniture making capital for this, the whole state in the late 19th and early 20th century. A lot of great, a lot of great furniture came out of Sheboygan of all kinds. I'm gonna do the rest of the program from right here. <laughs> this chair still sits very, very nice. Um, you know, they're wonderful, they're functional, they are they are usable. Um, sometimes on Antiques Roadshow, uh, we talk in code, and and one of the one of the code phrases that we use is, well, it has decorative value, <laughs> and that means that and that means that if if you want to display it and you want to enjoy it and in this case use them, I you know I absolutely would use them. That's fantastic. Just don't expect to make a whole lot of money on them. Uh, you know, I, I think you're looking at maybe $20 for the pair okay. on a good day. Uh, so, but I, I love the fact that you, you, you know, they, they are survivors only because you got them out of the basement. Right. <laughs> so, thank you. You're welcome. All right, we're gonna set that right here. And you know, I, I have purposely Purposely. Now, I, I think have we have we covered everything that we were going to cover? Yes, yeah, except for one. this. No, she has one too. Except for pardon? She said she. Oh, there were there were a couple little items, right? Yeah, there was the the McKinley coin. Yeah, is that yours? Okay, let's do that. It may be hard. It may be hard for everyone to see it, but we'll do that. So this tiny, tiny little token is actually what it is, rather than a coin. And it says, and I said, well, here we go. Um, first, how did you get this? Um, I worked in a bank, and I happened to be the coin vault teller. Uh -huh. And we would get uh, bags of coin in that came in a quarter bag right. from Fed. And it was my job to wrap them. And um, Fed stiffed me <laughs> that thing for a quarter. <laughs> so to make my quarters come out, Another teller watched me take a coin out of my purse, put it in there, and I kept it. Well, you had to make it official, right? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. you can. <laughs> well, it's, it's, first off, it, it's an amazing survivor uh, because it's, uh, it says McKinley's funeral train, September 16th. And of course, he died on uh, September, so what was it? It's on the back here. September 14th, 1901. And of course, he was assassinated at the, the Pan, American, Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York in 1901. Um, and the interesting thing about this little token is that it has, it's actually a piece that has been run over by a train. It's, you know, it's the, <laughs> we used to put pennies on the tracks when I was a kid. And that's exactly how they came out. But then they took these and they were inscribed. Um, it's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful little relic. Um, I, I have to say I have never seen one before, and I can only find information on this having been sold in a, in a larger group of McKinley related uh, items, mourning items, uh, usually usually small posters, you know, with a with a black wreath around. Um, the, one of the most popular uh, stereo cards, if you all know what stereo cards, you put them, drop them in a viewer and you can look, look, look three dimensional. One of the most popular sets of stereo cards was uh, the cards documenting McKinley, McKinley's funeral. So I could only find it having sold as part of a larger set. Um, but it's, it's still, you know, I, it, it wouldn't be a numismatic related uh, collectible. It's a presidential uh, piece, um, and it's, it would also be, you know, I, I guess it would be considered a mourning collectible. There's a, there's a whole group of 
strange people who collect things having to do <laughs> with with death. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no, they're they're nice people, but you know they. I I, I, I have them. I, I I get a you know I can only picture them all sitting down and watching Tim Burton movies. You know. Uh, uh, but no, no, they're, they're. I mean, I think today, if you wanted to sell that uh, on its own, probably ten dollars. But you know, for a quarter, for a quarter, that was a that was a good investment. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Okay. Now I know there was also a, a, a baseball card there, Alex Rodriguez. That's probably a thirty or forty dollar card. And but maybe now, if his career is over, maybe it'll maybe it'll go up in value. But I really want to talk about this. Um, who who belong now? Is the lady or the owner of this here? No. no. Uh, one of our workers, she's not. Okay. It's a it's a just a phenomenal vase. Uh, actually, I suppose it, the, the the form is kind of an oil jar. If it was really really expensive, it would be a vase. <laughs> but it's it's a vase. <laughs> um, but it is decorated. I mean, there is this amazing school of fish and sea creatures and eels and starfish that just are swimming. Look at this, look, look at this thing, the flying fish or something. It is just completely, uh, it's just off the charts uh, cool. There's a swordfish. Um, when I saw it, I knew that it was Italian. But it's in terms of Italian pottery, it's it's one of the best I've ever seen, and it's very clearly marked on the bottom, Italy, and it has a style number, and it says uh, Pesci, P-E-S-C-I for fish, and then someone wrote thirty plus or something like that. But but there's a little mark here which I have not been able to uh, decipher. It's a it's a really wild and wonderful example of Italian Majelica. And Majelica is, is a, a type of pottery that goes back thousands of years. It was, it was kind of rediscovered in the mid 19th century when uh, Thomas Minton of the Minton Potters in England reintroduced Majelica pottery at the Crystal Palace exhibition in 1851. Um, and it, it, it took the world by storm. People were making, making these pieces in the millions. The, the English uh, Majelica pieces have kind of a real dr bright, drippy glaze. The German Majelica is very, very restrained and very, very minimal. Um, American Majelica, uh, there were just a couple companies making these, is very much in the English style. But the Italians just went nuts uh, with these pieces. And this is actually much more subdued uh, in terms of, of color. I absolutely love it. It's 20th century, but I have a feeling it's probably, oh, teens or 20s, maybe, maybe into the 30s. Um, it's, it's, it's just an outstanding piece of pottery. Majelica, we should say, is the name comes from the, the misapprehension that these pieces all came from the island of Mallorca. So when these were being made in the Middle East, in Persia, and, and other places there, they were shipped across the Mediterranean and to Europe. And one of the transfer points, the main transfer points, was the island of Mallorca. So when the, the you know, they kept seeing all this pottery coming in, from, from the island of Mallorca, they eventually just started calling it Majelica, uh, uh, or their pronunciation of it. For, that's what we call it today. So that's how it got its name. Um, you know, tin glaze earthenware, low fired. It was not a high fired piece. It was not meant to stand up to wear. And so typical of these, you know, you get the little chipping down here around the bottom, a little flaking all the way around. Um, but you know, it is just, it is so much fun and exuberant and beautiful with all those, all those crazy fish. Yeah, I just, I think it is just a, a spectacular 
uh, example of, of 20th century uh, Italian, and maybe there might be a little earlier than that, uh, Italian Majelica. Um, that's a $500 vase right there. It is just absolutely wonderful. I think any, any collector, not just of Majelica, but of a wonderful figural pottery uh, would love to own that. I always say in my programs that I never offer to buy or sell um, on, an, on a commission. This is one of the times I wish I didn't have that rule. <laughs> it's a great piece. It's a great piece. So we're going to put that back in here. And um, again, thank you all for coming. I hope you had fun. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I always say that, that I, I hope everybody has a good time. But honestly, I have more fun than anybody else at my program. So uh, please, again, feel free to take my cards. And uh, hope to see you down the road soon. Thank you. Thank you.